Dominic, thank you very much. Um, it's really great to be here, and thank you for inviting me to speak for my first time at one of the international conferences. Well, but you weren't trans or lesbian. No, so I know. I know. <laughs> Um, and I just want to say thank you to Tim as well. It's always really, gr I really like hearing you talk, particularly about intimacy, which you know clearly is your special area. Um, and this morning it was even better to hear you talk about it because I forgot I was coming next just <laughs> after you. That was really nice. Thank you very much. Um, when I am asked to do a presentation within time, sometimes I end up speaking really, really quickly. So if a couple of you could uh, point at me if I'm doing that or give me some indication, that'd be really nice. Um, and if Dominic, you could say I'm about halfway, that would probably help me not to get lost. Um, so uh, my name is Chris Whiteley. I am a clinical psychologist. I am one of the clinical associates with Pink Therapy. It's really nice to be here with some of the colleagues about that. Yeah. Is that better? No. Yeah. Is that better? <laughs> not sure about that. Anyway, is that better? Okay, great. Uh, my name is Chris Whiteley. I'm a clinical psychologist and I'm one of the clinical associates with Pink Therapy. Um, I work in the NHS and I also work uh, privately. Um, I also work for a little while with Public Health England who uh, kind of have the national um, strategic oversight for sexual health and uh, drug and alcohol services in the UK. And it was at that time, at the end of my time there, that um, they first started to pay attention to chemsex and how they might respond uh, in terms of treatment services. So some of what I'm going to talk about today is drawn from that time. Um, and this is a hero of mine, Captain Pugwash. Um, for those of you who weren't watching children's television on the BBC in the 1970s, Captain Pugwash was a cartoon character. Uh, he was a pirate of a ship. Uh, and he had a band of uh, jolly men who came around with him. And they got in and out of all sorts of jolly japes. Um, uh, there's also rumour that there was a lot of double entendre going on around with the uh, characters, but I actually understand that isn't true, sadly. Uh, anyway, I brought him along because I wondered if he might be able to help us really find, uh, you know, chart our ways in some stormy waters. Let, let's see what he has to offer us. So the idea of a perfect storm was written about in The Lancet first in uh, 2013, really, describing uh, uh, a combination of behaviours where the transmission of both HIV and hepatitis C, um, as well as a catalogue of ensuing mental health problems. But it's interesting that what's written about here and what's written about early on in uh, talking about chemsex was, uh, was this drug practices was this a sexual health problem? Uh, was it a mental health problem? Um, and it's really interesting to think how um, that perhaps mirrors some of the difficulties we might have in thinking about new phenomena as they come up uh, that may not fit our um, uh, ongoing ways of looking at health problems. In the, in the article, it was linked to um, what was very concerning at the time, obviously, was uh, a ri about a 33% rise in new HIV diagnosis in London about that time. And although there was no evidence for the link between that and chemsex, it was obviously kind of considered to be um, something to be thinking about. Uh, and really this developed concerns that there may be new patterns of drug use occurring in uh, some men, have sex with men in London, that were increasing the risks for people to uh, be um, exposed to HIV, hepatitis C and other sexual health problems. But what I'm interested in really are, are these really the main harms that are associated with chemsex? And were these the main concerns of the men involved? How do we think about chemsex? Well, I'm grateful to colleagues at 5016 Street, who, as, as many of you know, have, have written and published and done an awful lot of work in this area. Um, and in terms of thinking about how we would understand chemsex, they talk about this being a word invented on geosexual networking apps. I think we probably know those better, as uh, Tim was saying, as hookup apps. Um, uh, and adopted by gay men's uh, um, health sector. I think what's helpful here is to understand that this was a, a term uh, coined most likely by the men engaged in this behaviour to begin with, um, and, and perhaps shows that it's not so difficult for, for them to understand new emerging phenomena as it was for us in the health sector. Really, it's talking about specific behaviours uh, associated with specific recreational drugs, um, and is particular to a specific high-risk population that is small and international, but a very sexually active group of men, often uh, always involving use of crystal methamphetamine or crystal meth, uh, 
methadrone, um, GHB, GVL during sex. Not, not part of the definition, but something that obviously people were uh, picking up and, and, and paying attention to um, was the use of these drugs by injecting. Uh, and again, the rise of a, another new term uh, that the men involved in this were coining for themselves as slamming. Within this, we, we're sort of understanding that, that perhaps people, that men were doing this because of the feelings of invulnerability that this may bring along, uh, developing ideas and feelings of being supremely confident, dismissive of the consequences, uh, enabling sexual adventurousness and experiencing heightened senses of pleasure. And really this may have become a public health concern that deserves a non-alarmist but proportionate response. Also important, I think, what, the, what was added at the end, and I really like this part, really, is that this deserves our compassion for a vulnerable group of people who may well be struggling with cultural changes associated with sex and relationships, um, and would certainly not benefit from further stigma or judgment, despite the sensationalist potential of these behaviours. I think the last part, really, is something I just ask you to hold on to um, as we go further through my presentation, uh, around the potential for... for um, things that involve sex, drugs and rock and roll, as you might say, to really capture the attention in ways that may not be helpful. If we think a little bit further, though, about what, what I sometimes think is the full chemistry of chemsex, so there's a lot of attention paid to um, the recreational drugs that are involved, but actually, if you think about the full pharmacy going on, it's likely to be very extensive. Some, but not all men will, taking part, will be using HIV medications, either as treatment for their HIV or increasingly uh, as PrEP, pre-exposure uh, pre prevention. We know that uh, HIV medications have, can have some uh, fairly dangerous interactions with substances such as GHB. Uh, we know also that, that some men involved in chemsex are, are using informal PrEP. By that I mean they are acquiring uh, HIV medications from their friends, etc., in order to, to protect themselves. Um, as we may have been reading about, there are fears that as PrEP uh, becomes more widely available, uh, while this may be helpful in terms of HIV uh, prevention, there are concerns that moves away from condom use will increase uh, risks of other sexually transmitted infections. Um, and another concern around HIV medication in the chemsex field is um, the ability of men to remain consistent with their medication during periods of sexual behaviour. It's also likely, given that the stimulant drugs involved in chemsex often produce uh, uh, intense feelings of wanting to be sexual, but they may also take away uh, some of the abilities in terms of erections. So it's likely that men involved in chemsex are also using erectile dif dysfunction medications such as Viagra. Um, this is again likely to be uh, obtained illicitly. Some of our old friends will still be around, so people using poppers during chemsex, uh, and there are, as we know, concerns around some interactions with um, erectile dysfunction medication. Further old friends that we perhaps sometimes overlook in thinking about chemsex, if you talk to men who are engaged in chemsex, they will say that uh, the use of the stimulant drugs will often also provoke them to smoke very compulsively, smoke cigarettes very compulsively. Um, and I think it's, it's worth not forgetting this in terms of the range of difficulties and harms that may be um, going on for people. <coughs> So thinking about what do we know and what we don't we know, and I guess it's important that we should remember that we do not know the prevalence and the epidemiology of chemsex. Um, but what I would also say is, is perhaps that's all we need to do. Perhaps we just need to remember that we don't know that. Uh, I, in some respects, would say that it's probably not the best use of the resources that we might have to go and seek that information, as it would be extremely complex to do so and very costly, and, and may really not add an awful lot to our understanding. But there is consensus, I would say, um, that in terms of uh, gay men and bi men, that, that it's probably a very small minority of men who have sex with men who do engage in chemsex. However, this is probably concentrated both geographically, indeed even within particular boroughs within metropolitan areas, um, and also demographically, probably the majority of men engaging in chemsex are living with HIV. Um, we do know that there are a range of very serious social, psychological and physical harms associated with these behaviours, but also a sizeable proportion of men experience very few, if any, of these and tell us that they are in control of their behaviour. However, an equally sizeable proportion experience a range of problems and harms and feel out of control. Um, these harms are likely to be new harms, things that they weren't experiencing before, or may well be exacerbation of coexisting uh, difficulties that people are experiencing.
But we do also know that there are ways to help men be safer uh, if they are engaging in these behaviours. But what about the sex? Interestingly, I, I think that uh, if you look at what's written around chem sex, very little is written about the actual sex that may be going on. We're often told that it uh, um, involves multiple partners, extended sexual sessions, and you know, generally we're led to believe that it's, it's, it's fairly hardcore. But if you think about the clients that I talk to, while some of their sexual encounters might resemble um, porn, porn star fantasies, uh, they also tell us that this isn't common, um, and in fact that they may spend most of their time having very little sexual contact and doing a lot of this, which is kind of links to some of what we were saying earlier. Um, uh, and I think that's, that's important in many ways, because to me that resembles what we understand from behavioural principles to be intimate and reinforcement. Uh, and by that I mean the understanding that um, the behaviours that we engage in may not always be followed by the desired outcomes that we're looking for, uh, and where that's intermittent, where mostly those behaviours are, are not followed by the, the outcomes we want, but occasionally are, that's a very strong um, reinforcing principle and largely the one that keeps gambling going. So there's a sort of link there between those kinds of behaviours. Um, um, for me, what's important around that is what we understand about intermittent reinforcement patterns um, is they're extremely difficult to help people change. Linking to some of what um, Tim was talking about earlier, the Sigma Group in London have done some really excellent research uh, in the chemsex area, and they particularly, in the chemsex study in 2015, they looked at uh, men engaging in chemsex who <coughs> lived in the um, London uh, boroughs of Lambeth, Southwark and Lewisham, which is the three boroughs that I work in for the NHS. Uh, and they're really, they're, they, they looked at the, these behaviours through uh, uh, several focus groups, really, and. Um, we're talking about how chemsex enables men to have the, some of the enables men to have the kinds of sex that some men really value, uh, in terms of this being facilitative, increasing libido, confidence, and stamina, uh, and also qualitative changes that, that they felt more attractive. The men they felt they were having sex with were more attractive, and increased their uh, range and intensity of experiences, and also enabled them to be sexually more adventurous. They also talked about the concerns, really. Some talked about how they'd become very reliant on chems to have sex, and in fact would report that there were very few, if any, instances of what they termed sober sex uh, for, for some months before. The majority who took part wanted greater connection, but they did recognise that chem sex wouldn't provide this. Many also talked about their regrets at the time loss for other social connections. Uh, many also talked about how negotiating sexual boundaries was complicated not only by intoxication but also by the group context in which they were in. If we think about the drug-related harms, uh, thinking first about some of these, I won't go through all of them, but thinking about the physical harms, including overdose. Now, GHB is probably the one where we would have the most concerns here, and this. Um, Unfortunately, the print's too small, but the, uh, a group of researchers at Imperial College in London have just done what I think is a really interesting study um, looking at the uh, coroner reports uh, for deaths in London between 2011 and 2015 that cite GHB as uh, drug-related death uh, um, involvement. And there were 61 in the four-year period, uh, and 60 of those were men. 65% of those had also used methadrone or crystal meth at the same time as the GHB, so looking as if it's the same context as chemsex context. 33% were diagnosed with HIV and probably some more were undiagnosed. Um, and actually in 25% of the 60, chemsex was mentioned in the verdict. So if you do a quick math, that's about one man a month is dying in a chemsex environment. Can't say that entirely, but that, that's what this is indicating, really. If we think about the mental health harms, really, uh, again, the use of these stimulant drugs, particularly crystal meth, which has a very long action uh, in terms of promoting paranoia, anxiety, and aggression. Um, and it's not just transient, really. I, I work in the acute uh, you know, admissions part of uh, a large mental health trust, and actually we see a f still see a, a steady frequent stream of men who are sectioned to mental health wards uh, because of the um, uh, you know, uh, acute uh, mental health symptoms that ultimately we find out are to do with their drug taking. <coughs> 
Um, again, we were talking. I was talking earlier about things like cigarettes and the, and the risks involved in that. The other, I guess, that we already know, a uh, big cause of uh, um, early death in men is suicide, and there are links between the kinds of drugs we're talking about and uh, suicide risk. If we think about sexual health, again, going back to Bourne, uh, the stigma study and uh, Adam, Bourne's, Adam Bourne's work, the men in those projects actually told us that, um, that although they knew about the HIV and sexual health risks, they were not the ones they were most concerned about, with the exception of hepatitis C. Um, the, the, the vast majority of men in these studies had very high levels of sexual health knowledge and this was informing their behaviour. It may not have been informing their behaviour in order to act accordingly to that information, but they, it was informing their behaviour. We also know that decisions about unprotected anal sex are, are mostly taken in advance of chemsex behaviour. So challenging the idea that gay men were having unprotected sex or high-risk sex because of the disinhibition effects of drugs or because of the context, actually many of these decisions are taken in advance. And that's particularly so for men who are living with HIV. Um, those men who regretted unprotected anal sex were more generally also uh, found to be, found negotiating safe sex difficult in other contexts. So again, it's not just the chemsex situation, it's making that tricky for people if, if that's what they want to do. What's often overlooked, I think, in the chemsex area is the, it, are the very worrying reports of unreported sexual assaults or people finding that their ability to consent to sex in these situations is, is, is it maybe impaired in some ways um, and feeling unable to report this later. In, in the chemsex study, the men were also talking about the use of apps in order to be able to talk about their HIV status and, and to, to find other people of similar HIV status as another, as another way of managing sexual health risks. So what can Captain Pugwash offer us? How might we find safe passage in a perfect storm? Firstly, thinking about a public health level, what are the population interventions we might do in this area? I think continuing to address the health inequalities for all men who have sex with men will contribute and add to uh, making these uh, contexts safer. I think we need to continue to provide accurate and trusted safety messages, particularly those that talk to the concerns that the men involved have. Um, and I think we need to continue to try and roll these out in the new spaces where men are, are, are occupying, the apps for example, just as we would roll out uh, safer sexual health information in bars and clubs before, it needs to come into the, uh, the online world in which people are um, occupying. We need to do things to enable people to report sex crimes. Uh, and we also need to kind of continue to develop our sense of what's becoming known as place-based healthcare. So rather than having different bits of healthcare dotted around in different areas because that's where departments are, actually trying to bring all those kinds of services together in some way, or at least the access to those services in some way, together in, in the places that the people involved actually like to access healthcare. And, and we know for, for gay men that they generally feel very comfortable to access healthcare in sexual health clinics. It's really important, I think, to continue to, to see HIV treatment as prevention, both in terms of encouraging and enabling men to uh, develop a suppressed viral load, which we know greatly reduces the uh, likelihood of transmission of HIV. It'll be, we have to, I think, be um, attentive to what the pros and cons will be of uh, increased rollout of PrEP. Uh, and increased testing, we will need to think, I think, be vigilant for new STI trends. Uh, but I think some of you may have recently seen reported in the media, which is fairly heartening, I think, that there are, um, it's likely that there's been a 40% reduction in new HIV cases in London last year. And some people are beginning to suggest that that may be because of the um, rollout of PrEP. And um, what about as individual healthcare staff? Uh, really, I would suggest that we are best taking it. Uh, a position of increasing safety. Uh, some, taking some advice from Captain Pugwash here who is in his life, life ring. How might we do that? Uh, really, I think it's important that we have all have chemsex competencies, uh, things that, that, that Tim was really talking about, about gay men's lives, how they like to, uh, how different ways in which they like, uh, like to join their relationships and spend their time. They, uh, it's important that we are informed about the drugs that are involved in these behaviours and the sexual behaviours. Uh, but to be remain flexible and responsive because we know that drug trends change over time. 
And remember that as therapists, we, we do have an ability to formulate all these aspects. And we've always done this, I think, in terms of helping gay men think about the context, the substances, and their sexual behaviour. Um, we have well-established behaviour change models that can help people. And I think it's also important to remember the basics. I, I, I wouldn't say that helping men stop smoking is the way to help them uh, change their um, chemsex behaviour, but I think we shouldn't leave it out in terms of encouraging people to be, uh, encouraging men to be safer in their, their behaviours. Uh, remember the strengths that, that gay men have. They're very good at accessing healthcare in sexual health settings. Um, and I think again touching on something Tim was saying, if we think of uh, apps as being similar in some ways to, um, to a gay pub, wh why not help people and coach people in, in hookup app skills just in the same way we probably always did in terms of um, uh, how people should communicate and could communicate. And finally, I think it's really I think good for us to remember those communities and individuals. We have a very proud history of working together with our straight allies to overcome some of the most serious health problems. Thank you.